All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca Podcast episode. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and it is good to be back with you. It feels like, I feel like we're doing these these podcast episodes far enough, I get, they're spread far enough uh, apart from each other these days that it almost is like hitting the reset button every single time I jump back in. Uh, but that's kind of fun. It's nice to come in fresh, and uh, we've got a brand new guest here on the podcast today with an interesting topic. I'll introduce Aubrey here in just a second. A couple of quick notes. For those of you that are live streaming right now on YouTube, youtube.com slash Boca Podcast, and then facebook.com slash Boca Podcast, make sure that you jump in, comment, ask questions. This is an opportunity for you to engage with myself and my guests today and be part of the conversation. So don't be shy. And then for those of you that are not live streaming, you're listening to the audio, sign up, subscribe, turn on notifications on YouTube and follow us on Instagram at Boca Podcast to find out the next time that we've got a live stream coming out so you can be part of the conversation and uh, join in, ask questions. You can even send me funny emojis if you'd like to. We'll have some fun with it. All right. And then one last note before I introduce my guest for today, just a quick reminder, look for opportunities day in and day out in your local community, nationally, internationally, with various organizations to give back. I made a donation to Charity Water today, as I promised you all that I would do before every episode. You can see this, the receipt there on the screen for those of you that are live streaming. But uh, I just want to take the opportunity to encourage you to continue to look for those opportunities to give back in some form or fashion. All right. Well, on that note, I want to go ahead and introduce my brand new guest for today. Aubrey Westland is here with me. Aubrey, thank you for working with me through some technical difficulties and, and making the show happen. Well, thank you for your patience. I'm really excited to be here. Well, no, and you know, I, I was saying to you before we started, and uh, our listeners who listen regularly would know this, that we've had some technical issues over the last few weeks, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like 2022, this is the challenge of 2022 is technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, but it, it's happened. Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, same, same. And it may just be a matter of shooting a quick message to our, uh, our, our the software company that helps us host these shows. Um, what just to kind of break the fourth wall, what you don't see, Aubrey, you've got a little bit of a control panel there. I've got a much bigger control panel with many different buttons and controls. So I, you'll see me kind of looking around the, <laughs> the screen, trying to keep up with all different kinds of things going on at the moment. I've got a light here and then a camera there and my mic and the headphones and all kinds of stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll yeah, try to make it. Yeah, that's a lot to manage. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to try to keep it all in line and make it happen today. But we'll just jump right into the conversation. Um, and for those of you listening in who don't know Aubrey, make sure that you follow Aubrey. It's Aubrey, A-U-B-R-E-Y, Westlund, W-E-S-T-L-U-N-D. Aubrey, I have to ask you, how many times in a week do people put an A there instead of an E or a U? Do you get All that a time. lot? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was even doing no it as I was. No one ever says it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, it sounds, I guess you could spell it either way. But I, even as I was typing that out today for the show, I was like, oh, shoot, that's that's a U, not an A. Like, I had to correct myself. Yeah. But. Well, there's a quick little story to that. It's my husband's last name, and their family is Swedish. So okay. when they came to America, you know, with all the other Swedes, there were a lot of Andersons. So they changed their name to West Lund because they were all going to the West Lund. Really? You know, like in Swedish instead yeah. of land, it would yeah. be Lund. So, yeah, that's that's where it comes from. <laughs> that's a really cool story. Okay, well, some context then. So everybody who's listening in already knows Aubrey way better than most probably at this point with that backstory. That's really yeah. cool. So Aubrey Westland on Instagram, and then um, we'll bring your website up here in just a little bit, but AubreyWestland.com as well. And um, actually, you know what? Let's just go ahead and do that. So I, I know that we're going to be talking about stock photography today. And uh, as we pull up the uh, the website here, and let me do this here. Okay, there we go. Uh, again, AubreyWestland.com. Become boundless in your creativity. And you know, we, we normally jump here to a question about brand position. Is would you say that is a brand position statement for you, or what? How would you define your brand position statement, not only as a photographer but also as an educator? Yeah, it's definitely you know purposeful. Um, I was a photographer for over ten years, and I also had like a design business before that. So um, now I'm a business coach for creatives, and I really focus on helping them build multiple streams of income. I think that's really important for creatives to be able to give themselves space and like buy back their time freedom, you know, rather than just like 
completely filling out their calendar with one-on-one -on -one clients. So um, yeah, that's really what I help people do. And I think that being able to set up multiple streams of income gives you that time to, you know, be more creative. Yeah, diversify a little bit, right? So I, I'm, yeah, I'm jumping exactly. back over to your site. It says become uh, boundless in your creativity and your checking account. Um, it's time to dream bigger, find abundance <laughs> and financial freedom in your creative business and make money while you sleep with passive income. This is business coaching like you've never seen before. And um, so, of course, we're going to get into this topic of stock photography as a stream of income, a stream of revenue here in just mm -hmm. a little bit. But we'll come back to that here in just a few minutes. Let's talk a little bit about customer experience. So having been a wedding or a, a photographer, I say wedding photographer because I'm so used to saying it, but <laughs> a photographer for about 10 years, very similar to me actually. And yeah. then of course, working with photographers now, what would you say is one of the biggest ideas behind providing a really great customer experience? I think learning to anticipate your customers' questions and needs um, and finding a way to like answer those or provide for them before they even have to ask you. You know, as a wedding photographer, I would like have guides that I sent or, you know, I'd make sure to send out an email, you know, plenty of time before an engagement session to like help answer all of those questions. Um, and I really love to like map out this entire experience just like in a Google Doc. And then from there, I can like, you know, um, use like create a workflow in Dubsado, which is like my client relationship manager. Sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this is something that I really enjoy doing, <laughs> actually. Um, I like to put a lot of thought into like all the touch points that my clients might have with me and like how to make their journey really enjoyable. So this is an interesting concept. And I, I don't think most photographers being more the creative minded versus the like super organized types, personality types, if you will, tend to think in a way that you just described, which is to kind of proactively map out really anything. I mean, you know, business strategy or otherwise, if you're talking about mapping out customer experience and it does start with knowing you're talking about being predictive in the way that you answer questions. So you, you have to know your, your target market really well in order to do this. But what does it actually look like? If you don't mind just sharing briefly, on a very practical, tangible level to map out that customer experience. How would you go about doing that? So first I, you know, there's like different phases to it, but the first phase would be like, how's the client gonna find you? What is that experience gonna be like for them? Um, you know, whether it's like your website or your Instagram account, how's that like gonna make them feel? And then there's the experience of them reaching out to you and, you know, what are those touch points? Do they fill out a form on your website? And then like, do they get an email? Um, I know, I feel like a lot of photographers use HoneyBook and that's the same as Dubsado where you can like set up workflows where you, you know, you can have like your emails set up and ready that as soon as you get, you know, um, as soon as a client contacts you, you can like have an email ready and you can just click send on that, you yeah. know it'll like automatically fill in some of their information. So right. just kind of like thinking, you know, I feel like with photography, this is pretty easy to do because most of your clients are gonna have like a very similar mapped out experience. They're gonna, you know, maybe hop on a call with you and then you'll have like their contract ready and like easy for them to sign. And then maybe you wanna send them a welcome gift and maybe you wanna like have some emails ready for, you know, to just like get into contact with them along the way, because I know sometimes there are like, you know, months of time where like you don't really have anything to say or do, but just like having an email to check in with them or sending them, like I said, maybe some sort of guide before their engagement session that really helps them prepare and get ready. And you make um, an interesting yeah, point too. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you, you, you talk about the fact that the customer experience tends to be, or the, the journey, if you will, tends to be pretty similar from client to client, regardless if you know, they're a portrait client or they're a wedding client or otherwise. And I think that's a really great point to highlight. And we could spend easily spend an hour on this topic, but it's a great point to maybe highlight and kind of finish on in this, in this segment because photographers, and I think in many cases, tend to spend way, way, way too much time on their business when the reality is, and again, we're not talking about not putting hard work in where it matters, 
But those things that yeah. are similar, that are repeatable, that do tend to be the same over and over and over and over again, utilizing tools like Dubsado or HoneyBook or otherwise, we can automate a lot of that workflow, make it much more efficient for us and for our clients and save time, mm -hmm. have more time in our lives like you're describing. So I think it's really important to note. I'm glad that you that you highlight that, but actually it's a great segue too to my next question, which has to do with time. You talked about your family and of course you have had multiple businesses now. Um, and I'm curious if there's a big principle driving your ability to manage time to find some type of balance therein. So you're not like just working all the time or you're not <laughs> too easily distracted by personal life where it you know, interferes with your ability to continue to grow your business. What's that big idea driving mm -hmm. that? Well, to be honest, I love to work, so it is hard for me to take a break and <laughs> stop working, but I think that's where, like, it actually really helped for me to have a child because, <laughs> you know, she's three and she's not going to let me work, you know, most <laughs> of the time. So yeah. it's like I really have, like, these time constraints, and that helps me to stay focused. You know, I know that, like, I've got two days of daycare every week on a good week, so... I am super productive now, you know, in those two days. And um, yeah, I just, you know, I don't take it for granted anymore. And when she's home and wants to play, I don't, I just, I can't work really at this point. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But you knew, you, you know what time you have to work with. And so you capitalize on that. And I think that's really important. Yeah. And this is something that's come up on the podcast quite a bit is, you know, when, when you're kind of forced into a corner, it's funny how we as humans just naturally tend to be much more efficient. Like we, if we know we have two days a week to really get focused work done in, it's amazing what can happen in that. Something I've been experimenting with lately too is I wear this Fitbit for the sake of tracking sleep and, and activity, but it's got a great little timer on it, a vibrating timer on it. And, and I can just flip that to like a 20, like 30 minute, for example, 30 minute segment, time segment. And I can run that timer and I know that when I'm done with that 30 minute segment, um, maybe I finish up whatever it is that I'm working on, but I can move on to the next thing and it kind of keeps me dialed in. I also, in the back of my mind, I know that that timer is running. So it pushes me a little bit. I like, okay, I have 30 minutes to get this thing done yeah. <laughs> and then I can go to the next thing and it really focuses me in. So I think again, a really great principle for mm -hmm. all of our listeners when it comes to time management. Yeah, I've done something like that too. And even like the, uh, you know, the tasks that you've put first in your day are the ones like that I know need the most um, the most focus and concentration so I'm not going to start my day like answering emails and doing things that are going to get me distracted yeah. I try to like front load my day with those bigger more important projects that need like require more of my focus yes so so important mm -hmm. I'm actively working with my team um, I on this kind of idea here which is even like you know we've got slack and we're communicating through slack pretty consistently through the day. And yet what I said to them the other day is just kind of reminding them, look, like as much as Slack is an instant messenger, essentially, right? The last thing that we need to be do, doing is being distracted by that constantly, whether, you know, very similar to text messages and emails, especially for those who leave their notifications on all the time, it, you can easily just get distracted left and right and not do, like you were saying, the things that are most important that drive our business. Yeah. So it's important to, to give I guess you could just say focus time to, even if it's a half hour, an hour a day, whatever it might be that we're giving that focus time to those most important tasks that truly drive our business that do need the most kind of mental resources and creativity. That's super, super important. That's a great reminder. Yeah. And using airplane mode on your phone is another good. Yeah. <laughs> a good or, trick. or focus mode too, right? That's something that's been implemented in, in the last little bit that can also be helpful. Well, that's, that's great reminders. Um, and, and I want to kind of use that yet again as a segue to my next question, which has to do yet again with time management. Delegation is something we talk about quite a bit here on the show. And I think yeah. it's probably the most outside of, you know, understanding what's driving our business, which then enables us to focus on what actually matters. I think delegation is probably the biggest time savings, you know, outside of automated software, like you were talking about as well. But um, it's especially for photographers, you know, it could be editing, it could be album design, it could be administrative tasks. Is this something that you experimented with in any of your businesses? Have you found some success in that? Yeah, definitely. Um, for a long time in my photography business, I, you know, I thought I had to do everything myself and I didn't really ever like get into outsourcing for many years. Um, and then, you know, once I started this new business, I have less time to work. I, you know, like I said, I have a three-year-old now, so um, I almost 
I have to outsource, but I've seen how that's really helped my business um, just grow so much quicker. So yeah. I now I know that it was like a liability that I wasn't outsourcing the things that I didn't have time for. Um, so I always, you know, I start with like, with the things I'm not good at and I don't want to do, or the things that just never get done. I think that's a really good place to start outsourcing. Um, and yeah, I know it's hard when you have a small business, but it, I've just really seen the benefits to it and how, you know, your business can just grow so much quicker and you can focus on the things that you're really good at. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So yet another question. Yeah. We're going to totally transition here. Favorite <laughs> book, business book, self-help book oh, that you would okay. want to throw out yeah. there for our listeners. What, what comes to mind? This question's hard because I read a lot, <laughs> um, but this year I finally read The Artist's Way and I know it's like it's 20, 20 or 25 years old, but that book like changed my life. Um, it's it's like a course on creativity and it is just so good. Um, Julia Cameron, I think is her name. Yeah. Um, she, in the book, there's this exercise called morning pages and it's like this stream of consciousness style of writing that you do like first thing in the morning. And it's been like life changing for me. Like so many of my ideas have come to me during that time. And it's just, you know, it's, it's almost like you clear out the noise in your head first thing in the morning. And then that's when like, you're really able to focus and those good ideas really start coming through. Um, so that's one that's been great for me this past year. And then I've all, also gotten into Mike Michalowicz's books like Profit First yeah. and The Pumpkin Plan. And those two are really, really good. I, you know, I know they've been out for a while, but um, yeah, those have really impacted my business this past year too. And I'm and I'm pulling. Uh, I, I just had the artist way up on screen on Amazon for anybody who's live streaming. Of course, you can see this "Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Um, by the way, great job pronouncing his last name because that's a that's a tough one to pronounce, <laughs> or at least it looks <laughs> like it is. I listen to the audio book. I listen to the audio book, so he talks about his last name a lot. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Okay, well, so we've got that there. Of course, we'll link to this in the show notes. Um, Jesse, who is streaming from YouTube, says I'm reading the Artist Way right now. It's really impactful. And, I, and thanks, by the way, Jesse, for, for commenting. For those of you who are live streaming, there are a number of you. Please don't hesitate. Don't be shy. Comment. Ask questions. Love the engagement. And thanks, Jesse, for, for listening in. I've not actually had the opportunity to, to read the Artist Way yet. So that may be one that has to go on my on my list. I've got this massive Kindle library right now of books yeah. and I'm, I'm trying to be like super disciplined and just stick to one at a time. And it's so hard because there's so many great options. I know, I know. Yeah, even if you just like read the first part, the exercises that she recommends you do every week, um, yeah, that will be life changing. Cool. Well, we'll definitely put that in the show notes. And by the way, for anybody listening in, this is something we don't mention enough really, but bokehbookshelf.com, just like it sounds, B-O-K-E-H, bookshelf.com. For those of you listening in and streaming, make sure you go take a look. If you're looking for some books to read, the, some of the most popular recommendations on the show in 500 plus episodes, you can go find there in a really nice little organized fashion, uh, bokehbookshelf.com. Go take advantage of that. Uh, okay, Aubrey, one last question before we get to our top, main topic at hand. A favorite right. piece of gear. I, I know that you don't actively shoot now, but during those 10 years or so that you were photographing, what would you say was like your, you just had to have the, this piece of gear in your hand or use it all the time? What comes to mind? Well, I'm actually, now that I'm shooting less, I've fallen more in love with film and I have a Pentax 645 oh, and nice. I just, I love that camera. Um, anytime I get, you know, my film scans back, I'm just like amazed by <laughs> what comes out of it. Um, so yeah, that's what I use like at home with my family and you know, those moments that I really want to remember. I really love that camera. How, let me ask you this because I, I have um, at least two different film cameras sitting in my closet in there that I, that I love, um, have a lot of character to them. So the idea of pulling them out and photographing with them is great, but with, with a, and both, both of them are film. One is, is a medium format. The other is 35, but is there like, do you naturally at this point, just pull that camera out to photograph your family, knowing that you have to go through the process of developing film what, like, what is that? Do, do you have a process or is it just kind of organic? It happens whenever you think of it. Um, yeah, it's, 
It's more organic. Like, I'll leave it out. Like, I left it out on Christmas just so that I made sure to, like, take some photos with it. Um, or I still do family shoots from time to time. I don't really, you know, adver advertise it. But usually I'll come home with some leftover film in my camera and I'll just, like, take some photos over yeah. the next few days. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. All right. Well, um, for those of you who do not shoot film actively or have never shot film, you've got to at least give it a shot. Um, I mean, my favorite camera still is um, a Yashica twin lens reflex camera. It's a medium, medium format camera. Everything is totally manual. Oh, no yeah, built-in um, meter or nothing. Everything's totally yeah. manual. <laughs> and I love it, though, because it really, there's just this very almost cathartic uh, experience through using it. It's relaxing mm -hmm. and almost meditative in a way where you have to think through everything and take your time with it. I love it. That's beautiful. So, yeah, for those of you yeah, listening you in really or watching. Oh, go ahead. You really have to like plan out the shots that you want and yeah. like be really intentional about it, which I think is another reason why the photos always turn out, you know, just a little bit better yeah. than <laughs> digital. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great point, actually. Yeah, a little more thought behind the picture. Okay, well, for everybody listening, and I know you're you're here understanding that the topic at hand today, we're going to be talking about stock photography. And Aubrey, before we get into some of the principles that drive creating a stock photography, whether it's a, a business or this is a secondary stream of, of revenue or income, um, I'd love to get a little bit of context in your experience, your background. Did you always yeah. shoot stock photography? Was it something that you added in as you went? Kind of what brought you to the genre? Yeah, I sort of fell into it, actually. Um, like I said, I was a wedding photographer, and I actually... Um, an agency called Offset, which is, they're like the premium collection for Shutterstock. They actually reached out to me early on. You know, I think they were just like looking for photographers for their collection. And it was just like one of those emails that I kind of ignored until the slow season. And then, <laughs> and it was like, okay, like this looks legit. I think I'll give it a try. <laughs> um, and I just started like, you know, fumbling through uploading photos. I didn't really understand the rules, you know, how it all worked, but, um, I sold my first photo and it was a photo of my dog. <laughs> no way. And I was so, it was, it sold for, I, I think I made like 130 or $150 off that one photo. Wow. And I was like, okay, I think I need to take this seriously, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it became a way that I could like shoot anything I wanted. And I also, you know, could like upload photos from different, jobs that I had, even from weddings, I was able to upload some of that work. And it was just kind of a way that I could shoot whatever I wanted and start getting paid for it. Um, so yeah, that's how I, I got started. And I gave myself this goal to have a thousand images in my portfolio by the wow. end of that first year. So yeah, I think like that just having that motivation is what really like kickstarted it for me. I've never been a, a what well, at least not for some time. I've not been like a huge New Year's resolutions guy, but what what I have been <laughs> um, trying to do more intentionally, even in the last I don't know, couple of weeks, month or so, I've been just thinking about it a lot more and being more intentional about setting specific goals. And when you talked about keep like having setting this target, this goal of having a thousand images in your portfolio in a given amount of time, it's amazing to me how having a really specific target or specific goal can really push you. You know, I mean, I, I know that we all have a lot of yeah. different things to juggle, whether we have family, friends, business or, or otherwise. But in the back of our mind, if we always have a goal or a set of goals in mind that we're working towards, it gives it, it really helps kind of focus us and motivate us and push us. And I think that's really yeah. important. I know, again, a whole different topic we could spend a lot of time on, <laughs> but I'm just glad that you mentioned that. I think that's really great. Now, I, I have to, well, so two, one just very quick side note here. I'm, I'm curious. You talked about wedding your wedding photographs being able to use them in stock photography i didn't plan on asking you about this but was there something that you had to add to your contract to accommodate something like that or what does that what does that look like yeah so the photos that i would upload um you know there were more photos of like the setting or you know like the the cake or the table settings, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I didn't have, I didn't ask my clients to sign the model release for stock photos. I just like never really felt right about that, especially, sure. you know, I've, you know, they're, they're paying me the price that I asked for their, for their wedding. So yeah. you could, like, I, I did have some friends, you know, we shot their wedding and, 
and they had signed a model release for me. But for most of my couples, I didn't request that they do that. Okay. Um, yeah. Fair enough. I, I just didn't, I, I know that, um, well, I mean, certainly any photographer running a business should have good legal contracts in place. And I just didn't know if that was something mm -hmm. that, that photographers needed to kind of keep in mind. So that, that's good that you make that distinction, which is what you were, what you were using as stock photos were, didn't involve subjects, your, your clients. And if that happened that you would need to get a model release. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Yeah. But yeah, I, the agency, they won't even accept the photos of people if you don't have them sign their model release. Okay. So even if you have a model release in your contract, usually the agency wants your models to sign like their, their like Shutterstock model release. Wow. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's good to know. So everybody listening, especially if you're new to this, that's a, <laughs> a really great tidbit already. Now, I, a question for you, because when I think about running uh, or creating and then running a business... I have a bit of an obsessive tendency with not wanting to do what other people are already doing. And when I think about stock mm -hmm. photography, I think about a space that is, at least it seems to me from the outside, I've never shot uh, for stock photography, shot stock, stock photography, but it seems like a really crowded space. I mean, there are just millions and millions of images out there on a, what seems like a million different websites. Is this, yeah. and, and this is a little bit of a rhetorical question, you obviously have done it, but it, is is this actually a viable business like is it too crowded for too many photographers to think about getting into the space what what is your perspective on that well i think that it is a bit of a misconception that there's you know that it's it is very saturated but okay. also like our world is always changing right mm. so like there are always new subjects that you could photograph there's always like more needs that businesses are going to have like for example back in 2020 do you think that there were many photos of people wearing masks <laughs> on <laughs> these enough. websites like <laughs> there there weren't like and there's always going to be trends that are changing and um you know you probably have like the image of like these really overproduced stock photo shoots in your mind with like the really cheesy people like True. sitting around a, an office or something and like Yes, at one point, that's what customers wanted, but that's not really what they want anymore. So now there's room for photographers with more of like a natural photojournalistic style to come in and like add their work to collections. Um, yeah, and I've talked to like designers, for example, who they, you know, they have to use stock photos in their work and they could probably tell you like 20 things that they haven't been able to find through Adobe stock or whatever agency wow. they use. So, okay. <laughs> you know, so doing your market research will really help you kind of stand out and fill in some of those gaps if that's what you want to do. But yeah, I think like a big thing is that now businesses are looking for more like natural photos of people. Yeah. To that point, yeah. and, and this is by no means a shout out, this is not a sponsored podcast, but I, I've used unsplash.com quite a bit in the past as a as a resource for photos and I have this is kind of a two-part question for you uh, or mm -hmm. one I guess maybe more an observation and then a question but one of the things that I loved about Unsplash is that what I was getting there was a lot I mean there were a lot of photos there that just didn't seem like that stereotypical stock photo like you were talking about it looked like yeah. a, like a great photographer friend of mine who's super talented went out and took some pictures and posted it to the site and it was it was so refreshing to actually have a resource that would allow you to, to, to be able to have that type of photo, not something that looked like it was set up with studio lights and everything else. But I do have a question, and I'm kind of going out of order here, but I, I do have a question about that, and I would love your, your take on sites like Unsplash who offer just thousands, if not millions, of images at no cost to the user. Um, I know, I think not too long ago they were acquired by, I don't know if it was iStock or one of the companies out there, but um, they so you have the option to be able to purchase kind of the premium images but mm. are, what's your take yeah. on photographers who are getting into the business uploading to royalty free sites like unsplash versus getting started immediately with those sites that are going to ultimately pay you a royalty yeah i think that the way unsplash works i think maybe that you get like a an upfront payment like a one-time payment i'm not completely sure about that um or or like i think if getty owns them like getty might pay you a one-time payment so that you could upload to there but it definitely wouldn't be my first recommendation for photographers like it's if you you know if you want to like 
get your photos out there and maybe lead people back to like the premium version where they could pay for photos you know that's one strategy but um, if you're gonna do I probably call that like micro stock so if you're gonna do micro stock you want to get your photos on all the micro stock websites you can okay. to just um, increase your chances of selling got it okay yeah. well I, I want to kind of revert back to well a, a question that I have for you for all of our listeners I mean when they see you know we are kind of framing this today as an opportunity stock photography is an opportunity to generate passive income which I know is a specialty of yours um, this topic but I, I think it's important to to have perspective as business owners when we make choices to go into a particular genre or add some ele additional element to our business I think we should have perspective before we make those those choices and make those decisions and those moves so to that end I'm curious if there are some questions that you think photographers should ask themselves um, in order to maybe determine if this is the right fit for them going into stock photography, adding that to their business or as an additional stream of revenue. Yeah, I think first of all, you know, kind of going off of that last question you had, um, really being intentional about the agency you choose to work with and making sure that it's going to support what your goals are. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be mo more motivated when you when they make those higher price sales in the beginning. So if that's something that's going to motivate you to keep, you know, to keep up with uploading your work, then I would recommend, you know, you go with an agency like Stocksy or Offset um, if you can. And then, you know, if, if that's not really a big deal and you maybe want a little more help with the uploading, then an agency like oh, Wirestock or Cabin they're going to do a little bit more work for you. So Kevin, for example, you upload your photo once and they'll send it out to a bunch of agencies as long as they accept it. Um, so then you get, you, you know, you do the work once and then it goes out to, you know, six, seven, eight different agencies and you have that ability to sell it more often, but the price point is gonna be lower. And then Wirestock is another agency like that where they'll actually even do the keywording for you, but your sales wow. are, are gonna be a lot lower. Okay. Um, so yeah, and I, I actually have a resource I've created for that, my little black book of stock photo agencies, and that's oh, cool. on my website if you wanna, just cause I wanted to get all the information in one spot for people so they can make like a really good, um, make the right decision for them when it comes to what agency they wanna work with. Brilliant, yeah, so we'll make sure that we thing. link to that in the show notes too, we'll, we'll get that from you. But please go ahead. Yeah, and the second is just asking yourself, like, what's going to motivate you? Because stock photography really is kind of a numbers game. So, um, you know, I have a lot of people ask me, like, why am I not selling? And it's because they only have like two or three hundred photos in their portfolio. Um, you know, so that's like one of the first things I learned early on. That's why I set that goal for myself of having a thousand images because you really can't expect to make consistent sales until you have like at least that many images. Um, so like for me, actually, I was motivated because I wanted to pay off student loans. Um, I wasn't making it really enough in my photography business to also be paying those off. So stock photography was just like the thing that kind of like gave me that additional income to do that. So whether it's when you want to do something like that, paying off debt or, um, you know, saving for a down payment on a house or just working less, you know, just figuring out what's going to motivate you and um, you, you just have to stick with it. Yeah. <laughs> Can't give up too soon. Well, and I think this is a great, this highlights again, a really important point that we kind of come back to from time to time on the podcast, which is being really clear about your... I, I refer to it as a big picture view, but a lot of it is motivation, right? Why am I doing this thing that I'm doing? What am I intending to do with my right. life? And then at, in order to support that, what business model am I creating? And then that business model determines how we're spending our time day to day. So I, I love that you're at, you're encouraging our listeners to ask those questions. And I'm taking notes here as you're talking too. So I'm just going back. Uh, the first question is the stock agency you're shooting for supporting your goals. And again, it, it, you have to be clear about what your goals are in order to make that determination. Mm -hmm. And for those of you listening and watching, we'll make sure to link to that little black book of stock agencies uh, that Aubrey was talking about. We'll put those in the show notes. The second question, what's going to motivate you to create enough images in your portfolio to build a viable business? And that's super important too. Okay. 
So mm -hmm. if, if um, a photographer is able to answer those questions, then we walk us through or our listeners through the steps that you would recommend they take in order then to kind of move into this genre, whether it's solely exclusively or adding it to their existing business. Yeah. So again, first step is choosing your agency. That's going to affect your workflow and some of those things. So you do need to figure that out first. And then after that, after you apply or sign up and get accepted, then I would encourage you to upload literally anything and everything you can. Um, you know, I know some people worry like, oh, but like my portfolio, you know, they're, they're so used to this idea of like curating their portfolio yeah. and stock photography. Like it's not like that. Um, your work, you want your work to show up in search results. And even if it's like not the photo someone may be looking for, it could take them to another photo that's similar, that sort of thing. So first of all, you know, upload everything you can. That's going to help you get your numbers up. And then you also need to third, like understand all the guidelines. Um, that's going to help you, you know, save some time because you'll, you'll understand what you can and can't upload. You, you want to research how to keyword really well. Um, all those things are really important. So make sure you understand the guidelines. And then fourth, uh, I would say, you know, after you've uploaded a bunch of work, start taking note of what is selling. Um, that'll give you clues to what you should continue to upload or maybe continue to shoot more of um, to bulk up your portfolio even more, you know, even like planning strategic shoots. So making sure your portfolio is full of holiday type <laughs> type images, that sort of thing is going to help you um, have more consistent sales year round. And then the fifth is again, just to stay consistent, keep uploading. Um, it actually helps you make more sales the more consistent you are because it helps your images show up higher in search. So it's not just about like getting those numbers, it's also gonna help you make more sales the more consistent you can be with uploading. That's interesting. How, how does that work? Like it, yeah. um, I mean, I understand the idea of uploading consistently or consistently for the sake of building the portfolio, but how does that relate to the search process? Uh, I can't tell you like super technically, but I think it, you know, it has to do with like their algorithm. And okay. um, the interesting thing is like, say I upload a new collection of photos and then a few days later I make another sale. It's usually not the sale. It's not a sale from the photos I just uploaded. It's like an older photo. So it, it's helping all of your photos kind of like show up higher in those in those search results, giving them a better chance of selling. That's wild. OK, well, that's really cool. I, yeah. I want to I want to kind of go back through all the points that you just made. I, I want to give a shout out to everybody who's listening in and streaming and those who have commented as well. Uh, Laura is saying it's very saturated, talking, of course, about the stock market, but I've been selling steadily and more now since 2009. Wow. Like she said, trends mm -hmm. are changing all the time. And that's something I'm, I'm so naive, like I've got a simplistic in the way I'm looking at this. I, I didn't <laughs> think about the fact just that one variable, which is that things are changing all the time. I, I mean, and yeah. I say things, that's a very broad statement. And even in of itself, like there's so many different variables in our day to day life that can be photographed. And and the point that you made, Aubrey, I think it was like the, the second or third thing that you said was like set aside your ego, stop overthinking. Like, if, is this thing just perfectly pretty? Like somebody may be searching for that random image of that random thing. And there's always that opportunity yeah. to upload yet another image. So that's, uh, that's a really interesting thought. I, I know that actually some more well-known photographers, they'll upload work under a different name. Okay. <laughs> because they don't even really want it all to be associated with their name. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. And, and I can't, I guess I can't blame him in some instances, depending on what it is that they're uploading too. But, um, and then Ethan is saying um, that it would be a great resource. And, and yeah, Ethan, we're going to make sure to link to that black book that, that um, Aubrey was talking about. We'll, we'll do that. Aubrey, is that on your site currently yeah. or, or do you have a separate link? Yeah, it is on my site. It's also linked on my Instagram um, in my Instagram links, but I'll make sure that you have it so that you can share it. Okay, cool. Um, and for those of you who missed it earlier, Aubrey, A-U-B-R-E-Y, Westland, W-E-S-T-L-U-N-D.com. I've got it pulled up, of course, on screen right this second for those of you that are streaming. 
And uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for streaming and listening in and watching. Mm -hmm. And don't hesitate to keep asking questions, comments. We've got a couple minutes left here. But, Aubrey, I just want to jump right back through the points that you just made. It's a really interesting kind of practical suggestion. So choosing the agency, and again, we'll link to that resource. That was number one. Number two was upload anything you can. And when I think about, and I'm kind of partial to wedding photographers because I shot weddings for so long. I mean, the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of images that actually are still sitting on a hard drive somewhere that yeah. not only myself, but others have access to it. It's, it's kind of mind blowing to think about the potential there exactly. with the images yeah. that are just sitting and doing nothing currently. It could be very much what you're talking about, a stream of passive income. So that's that's wild. Number three, understand the guidelines, um, what you can, can't upload, the keywording process, et cetera. Is, is that is that very or does that vary from, I guess, agency to agency? Is it pretty extreme in its difference from from one place to the next? It doesn't vary that much, actually. You know, most of them are the same. Like, you have to have a model release. There are certain times when you need a property release. Um, there are things like intellectual property can't appear in your photos. You you know, because these photos are used commercially, so right. they're probably going to make money for someone, and they can't be making money off of, you know, an image with, like, a Nike logo in it, right? So... So all of those guidelines are pretty much the same across the board. I think the one difference is like how the agency wants you to keyword and add your descriptions to your photos. Um, some of them will let you embed it. I use Lightroom and just embed my keywords in the in the metadata, but cool. others, you know, they want you to do it on their site. So that's probably the one thing that may vary the most. Okay, that's good to know. Um... Uh, well, and I'm, that's that in and of itself is going to be part of the research process for anybody who wants to get into this. So make sure that you do pay attention to that. The fourth uh, point that you're making or really a question is what's selling. So photographers should pay close attention <laughs> to what what is working, what's not. I mean, we should all be doing this as business owners in general. Right. The, looking at the mm -hmm. numbers, looking at what look at what's selling, what's not selling and make adjustments as we go. But it's, it's important to pay attention. And then number five, to stay consistent in the shooting and upload process. I've realized now being in the photography industry for, uh, well, I guess it's over 20 years now. It's kind of crazy. More than ever, especially in the last couple of years or so, the significance of cons consistency in my personal life and in business. And it's amazing how like, you may not have the answer every single day. You may not know exactly what you're doing. You've got kind of an idea of the direction you're going, but just consistently yeah. showing up and doing the thing. I, it's, I mean, it sounds cliche because now we see it on Instagram and Facebook and every, you know, everywhere, everybody says it yeah. or there's some graphic. <laughs> Marketing. Or, yeah. But, but the mm -hmm. reality is it, it is true. Um, and I hate that it took me so long to realize the significance of it, but I, I have to encourage everybody with this last point that you make Aubrey, which is consistency goes so, so far. And it's not about necessarily getting the immediate results it's being willing to play that long game. Yes, definitely. It is. It's, very much a long game, but it does pay off, you know, um, just to like share a little bit of my personal story back in 2020, when the pandemic hit, we were still like all, most of our income was still coming from weddings and then they were all canceled or postponed. So, yeah. um, at one point stock photography was my only income stream and it's, it actually, you know, kept my family, kept us afloat. So, wow. Um, you know, that's the benefit of thinking more long term and providing some of that security for yourself. Wow, that's super impactful. OK, well, and, and David, to that <laughs> point, David, who's who's uh, watching on Facebook, says lots of great info. Thank you. And then Ethan actually has a question. Ethan, thanks for posing the question, too. As a family photographer, are there better stock sites for portraits versus still life versus lifestyle? Any initial thoughts there, Aubrey? Yes. So uh, I would highly recommend Offset if you can ex get accepted to Offset or there's another site called Photo Case, which is kind of similar to Offset. It's like a German company um, or, you know, all the micro stock agencies. Family is actually really one of the, you know, top selling topics. So hmm. that is that would be, you know, a good thing to upload to most agencies. Um Stocksy is probably the one that I wouldn't recommend. That would be probably better for, you know, more trendy portraits and still lifes and that sort of thing. Great. 
I mean, this is, this is lovely. I mean, it's so practical <laughs> and helpful. I really, I, and I really can't thank you enough. Yeah. And I know it's a big topic. You know, we've only been on here for about 45 minutes or so, and, and it's a way bigger topic than we could fit into 45 minutes or even a couple <laughs> hours. So to that end, um, I want to give you an opportunity. You already mentioned the fact that you've got this resource in your website, but um, give yourself a shout out, explain to our listeners and viewers how they can get more information about the coaching and help that you offer in this realm. Yeah, so I'm really active on Instagram and same with my my website. I blog quite often. So you can actually find a lot more tips about stock photography on my blog. And that's where you'll also find my services. I do private coaching uh, for creative business owners. I also have a course, Stock Photography Academy, which is opening actually on Wednesday. So that's really exciting. Um, if you, you know, if you want to really jump in and get the most out of this and get going, then that would be what I would recommend. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of free resources on my website too. Brilliant. Okay. So I, I was at, for those of you that are live streaming, you know, I was just pulling that up, those, those pages up on Aubrey's site, but we'll link to her website in the show notes. It's aubreywestland.com. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And then, of course, your Instagram as well, Aubrey. And I'll pop this up on screen. Aubrey Westlin, yeah. for everybody who's watching or listening in, A-U-B-R-E-Y-W-E-S-T-L-U-N-D. There we go. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Aubrey, Thank I really you so appreciate much. you making time to, to share with us today. It's been really practical and I think I, probably pretty inspirational for some. Um, they're like, oh, I have an opportunity. I, I could make an extra so. stream of revenue. I yeah. Hope so. Really, really cool. I, yeah, I really can't thank you enough. Think, and thanks for sharing with our community as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. <laughs>